My name's Anthony Padilla, and today I'll be spending a day with people with bipolar disorder to learn the truth about this heavily stigmatized disorder that causes extreme emotional highs and lows. By the end of this video, we'll find out. Is living with bipolar disorder a completely manageable hurdle that goes almost unnoticed in most cases? Or are the effects this disorder has on every aspect of life far too psychologically paralyzing for anyone to fully thrive? Hello, Rivka. Hello, Anthony. Joshua. Hey, thanks for having me. Tristan. Hi, how are you? What does bipolar disorder entail? We have very high highs and very low lows, mm. and it's like very dark in the low, and, and the high point, it can look like, I've got everything together, everything's fine, mm. everything's great. Or it can be like, have you drunk six Red Bulls? <laughs> like, are you okay? It actually looks like there's a chemical going, like pumping through your veins. Exactly. Can you explain the difference between mania and depression? Common misconception is that the mania is the fun part. Like mm. for me, the mania is not fun whatsoever. Racing thoughts, I gotta do this, I gotta do that. Oh my God, it would be mm. so cool. Like, why don't I just build a bookshelf? I truly like, felt like I couldn't stop. And then some trigger from a traumatic experience as a child or something would come up or a relationship would end or I would get into a fight with one of my friends and then I would get that crash and then it's, yeah, it's, it's hell. It's, you know, a couple hours, sometimes multiple days of just like being bedridden with mm. depression. You have the same thought, which is a delusion, which is this will last forever. Which almost perpetuates the length of time that you experience it. I'm always gonna feel this way, you know, which is not true. You know, after an hour, or a couple hours, you're, you're in a different state of mind. How does bipolar affect you specifically? Every nine days, it would cycle through, which is mm. looking back at it, I'm like, how did I live that way, you know? Were you kind of living like expecting that next up and expecting that next down? Yeah, I knew it was gonna happen eventually. I used to be a pretty heavy drinker and I'm like, okay, when I'm up, I'll drink so I come down a little bit. And mm. when I'm down, I'll drink a bunch of caffeine to try and get, and that just doesn't pay off long-term. And professionals call that self-medicating, mm. which is- Potentially dangerous. 100% yeah. incredibly dangerous. They would always, you know, label me as like, oh, like they're just hyper. And then I would just crash. And the crash would manifest in this depression, in this just very sad, uncontrollable crying, wanting to like never leave my bed. My highs were kind of, you know, where I lost control of myself and where I didn't know what was reality anymore. And that can rapidly go into several days without sleeping. Eventually I'm hallucinating. I don't know who's in front of me. It's also scary to be on the inside where, you know, you don't know if you're dreaming or awake. When did you first start exhibiting behaviors that you now know are related to bipolar disorder? It really kicked off when I was about 16 and it became very apparent. And how did that present itself? Being very angry um, and agitated and stomping around and having all this energy and not being able to sleep much. Early elementary, like third, fourth grade that I started to, to be super hyper and then have those moments of crash. I was overworked as a kid. That would lead me to these, these crashes of like, I I don't want to learn lines today, mom. I just kind of want to take a, a day off. Well, I had my breakthrough episode when I was 16. Yeah, I didn't come down for several days where I just kept getting more elevated. Everything in the history of man was coming down in this one moment. It wasn't that I have like, a, you know, a mental condition. The, the history of humanity is all coming down to me. Are there any potentially dangerous aspects to having bipolar disorder? I definitely self-harm with the destructive behaviors and um, something else is that like it really does kill people like it, it is dangerous to, to live with depression because in my darkest days I do deal with these um, trigger warning like suicidal ideations, um, untreated uh, mental illness, untreated uh, bipolar, untreated alcoholism, like untreated addiction like they're all very very severe life or death things and I think that Again, it's like people don't treat mentally ill people with the same 
compassion and, and um, gentleness as they do people with cancer or physical ailments. Mental illness is a chronic illness, right? Mm -hmm. It is mm -hmm. kind of a thing that yeah. you just live with. Do you remember when you were first officially diagnosed? I was probably about 24, 25. There's a service you can pay for out, out here in New York where essentially during court cases, you can take a psychological evaluation. Not having a court case, you can go to these people and you can go, I would like to be diagnosed, please. And that's what I did. And then from there, I you know, went to a psychiatrist and a therapist and they were like, yes, can confirm. And this is kind of a frightening thing. A lot of people don't catch it until they're like in their 50s. Oh. And I can't imagine going through half of, more than half of your life going, ah, oh, I don't, I feel these, way, these ways and I don't know. There's no explanation. I brought myself to uh, a hospital because I was experiencing like probably the worst depression I had ever felt in my entire life. I wanted to kill myself. The doctor that I was working with like went into another room and then I like got an email from this audition that I had booked something and I instantly like, everything's fixed, everything's great. Oh. I booked it, I'm good. I like called, I called my agent and I was just like, everything's amazing, I just booked this thing. And the doctor came back in was like, you're bipolar. And I was just like, <laughs> I know. <laughs> so did you have a sense of relief? I had suspected that I was bipolar and for a while I was afraid of the diagnosis and then when I got it, it kind of like was perfect in that moment of like, thank God that I know what this is now, that I have a name for it. Yeah. So now I can work on it. 2001, parents are called, you're taken from class and you go to the hospital. The doctors had to really sit with her and be like, he could like jump out of a, a, a building, you know, it could get really bad. The conversation naturally came up with my very first psychiatrist, which was like, well, when do I get off these meds and when do I go back to being me and just go back to school and go back to my life? This condition it is your life. It made it easier to take things in stride and it made me look at it like a health issue rather than some sort of uh, moral or psychological failing. Can you recall any big moments in your life that were clearly shaped by bipolar disorder? I went to this kind of uh, big event and it was a reunion for um, a film that I was in when I was a little kid and it was like our 10 year reunion and you know, it was like three full days of partying essentially. I went back to school after the reunion, after all of that partying, like with basically, I think a combo of like 12 hours of sleep over like a week. And then like, I had the crash and my body just shut down. I couldn't stop crying. I like simultaneously knew that I should eat, but couldn't get anything down. I remember like my dad coming downstairs and me just like weeping and I couldn't get words out. It was so bad. Has bipolar disorder ever affected any of your relationships? Every single one, whether or not I'm <laughs> aware of it. I do this bit in my standup of it makes dating difficult because is it like sex? Do you wait for the third date? You know, yeah, when do you I tell up? <laughs> Initially it's fine. And then as far as like being rejected, if uh, if like I'm going on a date and go, by the way, I have a mood disorder and they go, oh, well, that sounds like something I don't want to associate with. And I go, well, you sound like something I don't want to associate <laughs> with. I can come on as someone who is a suitable match in the beginning. Someone who is humorous and who is personable and a good listener. But then over the stretch of time, when you see the full range of emotions that I go through in a year mm. or two years, you might take, you know, second opinion <laughs> on, is this guy gonna be your you're, man? You're taking it back, you're, you're starting to reevaluate. Yeah, and, and I think the, the one thing I've learned about dating is that when, when I hold those stories back, it never goes anywhere because they can sense there's this hidden history mm. that I'm not, you know, divulging. Is there anything that helps you ease unwanted symptoms? At first I took medication that, and that was heavily monitored by my psychiatrist. I, you know, have a bunch, a list of just activities that I need to do that if I'm ever starting to feel low or feel dark, grabbing a book off my shelf and flipping to a random page typically, yeah. it's yeah. exactly what I need to hear. Or going outside, going for a walk, grabbing a donut. Just practicing self-care, being kind to yourself, being more present. And yeah, the number one thing for me is just like acceptance. This is probably something that I will live with for the rest of my life. And so in order to 
be able to live with it without it um, overwhelming me and getting absorbed and drowning in the like waves of my emotions, right? Just using these tools that I've found as kind of a surfboard so I'm able to like ride the waves. <laughs> and knowing Thank that you. sometimes the wind's gonna knock me off, right? But right. And, and I will land in that water occasionally. But we should be valuing be ourselves again. based on how we react to things like falling down instead of the fact that we fell down at all. Amen. There it is. I love that. You're a comedian and a bunch of your jokes and routines are centered around things relating to bipolar disorder. Has that at all been helpful for you? I think that humor is the first step towards, you know, communication and communication the first step towards empathy and empathy understanding. It's a chain. And if you can express yourself in a way that's, you know, it's palatable, mm. it's really helped kind of bridge gaps. I just kind of was on a quest to make mental illness funny again. You know? <laughs> <laughs> totally hilarious at one point in time. Doing a performance that is not just jokes, but it's also kind of a cathartic moment for you. It is very therapeutic, you know, mm. and you don't want your set to be just therapy. I right. mean, that's not fun, right. you know, but all performance is therapeutic, even if you're doing some silly stuff that doesn't mean that much to you. Before we continue learning about the world of bipolar disorder, how do you wish people in society would perceive and treat people with bipolar disorder? As God. I just wanna take a moment to reiterate that these videos are not intended to diagnose any condition or disorder, and I encourage anyone who feels that they might relate to any diagnosis of the guests in these videos to do some additional research and consider a proper diagnosis from a licensed professional. And that brings me to our sponsor, BetterHelp, who I'd like to thank for our continued partnership. I've talked a bit about how therapy has been really Really helpful for me but therapy can be customized to whatever is right for you and can be really useful in providing tools to help with motivation or feelings of depression anxiety stress insecurity or whatever else you might specifically need BetterHelp has been continuing to improve throughout the years and screens all their therapists to ensure that they have experience and are certified and licensed and they provide customized online therapy that offers video phone and even live chat sessions with your licensed therapist so you don't even have to see anyone on camera or speak over the phone if that's not something that you're comfortable with. Therapy can be expensive and the price of finding a therapist you like and actually click with can really start to get overwhelming which is why BetterHelp offers a more affordable alternative to in-person therapy where you can start communicating with your licensed therapist in less than 48 hours. So thanks again to BetterHelp who are giving I Spend a Day with viewers and listeners 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash Padilla. That's better H-E-L-P dot com slash Padilla. But hold up, because I'd also like to thank HelloFresh for sponsoring this episode. HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit that delivers fresh, pre-measured ingredients and seasonal recipes right to your door. So you can finally cut out stressful and time-consuming steps to cooking, like meal planning and grocery store shopping from your busy schedule, so you can enjoy your time in the kitchen while getting dinner on the table in about 30 minutes or less. HelloFresh also uses high quality, fresh ingredients that are sourced directly from growers and delivered from the farm to your front door in under a week, contact free, of course. My personal favorite part about HelloFresh is how everything comes pre-measured because I get to feel like I'm on a cooking show, just like plop, 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 bam, gourmet masterpiece right on my table. Not to mention the variety of meals that comes with each delivery is pretty expansive. And even if you are vegan, the veggie options are still great without the dairy. So go to hellofresh.com slash 14 Padilla and use code 14 Padilla for up to 14 free meals plus free shipping. Again, that's hellofresh.com slash 14 Padilla. Use code 14 Padilla for up to 14 Padillas. No, free meals, 14 free meals plus free shipping. Now back to the world of bipolar disorder. How do you wish people in society would perceive and treat people with bipolar disorder? As gods. As I gods. Think... Worship. Yeah, we have a god in the room, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> and everyone in between. Like, what are you talking about? They're, we're normal people understanding a person's problem and looking at it objectively. Hafsa X wants to know how you react when people say anyone with any kind of mood swing is bipolar. I think this is happening across all mental health 
labels. You know, I yeah. think people are just more familiar with what OCD or ADD is. Yeah. And they'll say, oh, I, I'm feeling a little bit that way. And I think that's all okay to use those descriptive terms. It kind of destigmatizes it where people kind of normalize those terms as just descriptive ways of being. It makes it, I, I think, more socially acceptable, but it, it, it might not exactly help folks. It's this very specific sort of right. judgmental thing. Also, it turns a medical condition into a personification. Mm -hmm. You know, if you say that person's bipolar, that's different than saying that person has bipolar disorder. So it would be a mislabel to say, that's a bipolar person. Absolutely, and it's, you know, only natural. It's categorizing things as how we survived as a species. Mm -hmm. It's instinctual, I understand it. It's just maybe not helpful. If there's anyone watching who feels like they might have bipolar disorder or they do have it, but they're afraid to talk about it because of all the negative stigma surrounding it. Is there anything you'd want to say to them? Don't be afraid to ask for help. I think those three magic words, I need help, are the most honest and vulnerable things that we can say and they don't get said a lot and it doesn't make you weak. It's actually a sign of self-respect, I think. It is a sign of self-respect, a sign of self-love, mm -hmm. and a sign of acceptance. Are there any aspects to having bipolar disorder that you are thankful for? It's given me definitely a lot of courage because like, to get up in front of people and say, I'm bipolar on the internet, that takes a lot of chutzpah, mm. as my dad would say. Translation? Uh, like, balls. <laughs> <laughs> Not what I was expecting. <laughs> What do you think the biggest misconception is about bipolar disorder? It's that it's constantly up or down. We sit on the surface a lot of the time. We're riding those waves. It's same. not all on or off. There is some in mm -hmm. between. Bipolar people shouldn't be trusted and they're not someone that, um, you know, maybe is worth your time. I think um, it's important to recognize that everyone has something going on with them. Everyone has um, personal experience that they are trying to get through. Whether that they have a label or not is really uh, up to them. All right, you got five seconds to shout out or promote anything you want directly to camera. Go. You could find me at Mad One Media at madone.me. Twitter account, Tristan J. Miller One, TristanJMiller.com. I do a podcast, The Amateur Detective Club. I host a podcast called Where Are We Now, where I get to connect, chat, and kiki with other fellow former child stars. Click the button. <laughs> There's a button somewhere. A it's button. below, it's most likely. I'm not sure. This has been fun for me, it should be fun for you. It's fun for me, especially when I click the subscribe button. After spending the day with these people who have bipolar disorder, I've come to understand just how important it is to encourage open conversation and understanding regarding mental health as everyone deals with so much more behind the scenes than we could ever truly understand. When I was a younger person, like mm. in my, my teens and 20s, early 20s, I'm still in my 20s. So take that, <laughs> uh, older people. Yeah, uh, you 30 I, pluses, disgusting. <laughs> yeah, I'm never gonna be old. Yeah, I'm never ever. gonna be 30. I'm totally yeah. under 30. Don't look at my wiki. Brag much that you have a Wikipedia page. <laughs> I've gone in and tried to make my own and Wikipedia's like, don't do that. We will, we will delete it.